if you study the Savior's ministry, in fact, as you read his life, this is where he would be. He wouldn't be in meetings. I'm sure he was here today. I mean that. This was the sweetest experience. I made dear friends today, friends that I didn't know until this very hour, and what a sweet opportunity it's been. Speaking as a Jew, as a rabbi, there is no higher calling than the calling to take care of God's children. I could be doing something else with my friends, or could be sitting at home binge watching my favorite show on Netflix. I am on my phone a lot, but when I do put it down to go help the kids, it makes me feel so good. The thing that was so astounding to me was the scale, the rows and rows and rows of chairs of people being helped. Really, if you didn't shed at least one or two tears during that event, you were made of stone. As we counseled together, it started to blossom as a real possibility. And frankly, it's moving quite beyond what I thought it would be able to do. And I was just sitting there, I, I pulled the app up on my phone, and I started scrolling through all these wonderful service opportunities. And right away, a couple of them popped up, like, oh, this would be perfect to do. I asked for Hannah, like, you know, what fates are we going to meet? And I remember she had told me that the lady whose home that we're going to, she's a Mormon. And I have never met a Mormon in my life. We built some incredible friendships and, and bridges with people not of our faith. It doesn't have any requirements of membership in anything. It's just a, a place that people can go to find things that we can do to help serve other people. Not too many people get to witness miracles all the time. And I do. Um, <laughs> This is a place of miracles. Our oldest volunteer is 103, and I work with lots of 102-year-olds, 100-year-olds, but it's been so beautiful to see all the different people get involved. It's kind of, I don't want to say addictive, but it's like you just get this itch to do it, and you just want to serve again and again and again, and it really changes your perspective. Go find what you love to do, and go find a way to serve in that capacity. Just get out and do it. When you study the scriptures, whether it's the Bible, the Book of Mormon, or even scriptures from other religions, it's clear that helping the less fortunate and helping your neighbor is an important part of religion throughout the world and people that feel that way are looking for those opportunities but sometimes find it difficult to connect to something that's right for them and their family. And so just serve is a tool that helps provide that connection in an easy way. Just serve is basically focused on doing what Jesus Christ would do if he were here. There is no manifestation of love that will ever equal the love of the Lord Jesus Christ for the human family. So I think all we do and have done in preparing Just Serve, the focal center driving force has been in our minds, what would Jesus want us to do? And that's what we have as a foundation, a principle that drives Just Serve. Our family, we're from all over the place. Susie's from Portland, I'm from Salt Lake. Uh, we spent most of our marriage in Chicago. And after about eight years in Chicago, we had an opportunity to move to Dallas. We love it here. It's really been good for our family. Dallas was one of the first cities to be selected to use JustServe.org. And when our family heard about it, we got online and browsed through the different options. It became something that we've used a number of times. Volunteers are needed to help One of the things that I love about JustServe.org is when you go on, you can tailor it to what your family might want to participate in. You put in your zip code so you know it's going to be nearby you, but then you can scroll through and it will give you a short description of what the project is. And it might be something as involved as going to a retirement community and spending time with the residents there, or it might be something as simple as going to a local park and picking up trash. And it might be something that you do one time, and it might be something that you do ongoing. You can tailor it to you and your family's needs. 
When our family first looked at JustServe.org, we were just looking at opportunities in Dallas. But the more I started thinking about it, the more I realized this really had potential to change people's lives, not just here, but throughout the country, maybe throughout the world. At the time of the Paris bombings, I became quite upset about the amount of hate and vitriol that was being spread, often by people who were ignorant of others who were different, and thought that somebody has to do something. We got together and had the first meeting in December. We had five Muslims, five Mormons, and five Methodist women. We met here at my house. We decided to do some cookie baking and to have a religious discussion. And we were all, I think, surprised at how drawn we felt to one another. It was actually really energizing, refreshing, exciting to see the similarities that we had, the openness, and the willingness to really learn more about each other's faiths. When I came into the room, I, we were all being very polite and very formal. And as the evening rolled on and we started making connections, oh, you have a boy in high school, so do I. Maybe they know each other, maybe they've... And you start realizing how much you have in common, that we were just a bunch of moms wanting to raise their kids. The Just Serve website is the main source of the community outreach for tapestry in the Minneapolis area. There were so many women in this good community who wanted to participate that we would go to the Methodist Church and do a service project one month, and then the next month we would be at the Lutheran Church, and then the Catholics and the Muslims helped us with the homeless youth food drive. And so we drew our youth in as well to teach them about service. Seeing kids walking down the street talking, all, with, all in different faith communities, but they're all just kids, and they knew that they were serving a purpose together. Just seeing that interfaith interaction made me super happy. It was a really cool experience. That was my first time going inside of a mosque, and we had to take off our shoes. And it was really cool. I saw one of my friends from school there, and I didn't know that I'd see her there. And we're like, oh, hi, how are you doing? I loved that. The kids walked in, and they could realize I'm hearing Arabic. <laughs> this is not scary. And then they get to share that with other people. It, it's not anything to be afraid of. The message I feel like is coming out in the church right now, especially in women's conference, that we all have been refugees at some point. When my husband and I were newlyweds, we had no money, we had no furniture. And I'll never forget the first families who invited us over for dinner, the family who gave us a couch. And so if I see somebody who is in that situation, I know what it feels like. We're all children of God. We are all brothers and sisters. It was December of 1999. At the time I had three babies and I was sitting in the rocking chair finishing knitting a blanket. And I thought, who could I knit this blanket for? And I saw my babies had a blanket of their own and they really didn't need another one. And I thought, oh, I could knit this for a child in foster care. And my thoughts didn't stop there. I thought, oh, what if I ask other people to help me do this? And so that little idea that I believe God had given to me has now turned into um, 17 years later. My very own blanket has given over 90,000 blankets away to kids in the foster care system. The mission of my very own blanket is dedicated to comforting children in foster care by giving them a handmade blanket that will provide comfort and security and a smile at a time when they need it the most. It's something tangible they can hang on to to help them in their journey. It meant a lot to me. This flood of emotions came over me because I know someone put their hard work into it. It was handmade, it was from the heart, it was beautiful. And I had that on my bed every night in residential. That blanket was always with me. It was pretty exciting the day that I got an email from the gal who was 
creating the Just Serve website and she said, we're putting together this website. We would like to make it easy for people to come and volunteer. Would you like to be a part of this? And I said, I'd love to. So I sent them my information and, you know, didn't think much of it. I thought, well, I'll just wait and see how it goes. And then all of a sudden these volunteers started to just appear at our blanket workshop and um, they started appearing on a weekly basis. Um, and it was very, it was um, so encouraging to see the result of that website and really how quickly it all came about. I had never heard of this project and I wouldn't have had the opportunity to hear about it if it wasn't for this Just Serve website. I mean, I feel like I'm involved in the community, but there's only so much you know when it comes to service opportunities. So that's what made it really nice with this blanket project is that, you know, we were able to come together and make these beautiful blankets and know that they were going to someone that really needed them. To make a blanket um, has been so fulfilling to them and it really makes a difference. And to be a part of the Just Serve website to help us get that word out to everybody. That's the goal of the greater kingdom and bringing it down here on earth and helping to show these kids that there is hope. CDA Cares was developed as an opportunity for dentists to deliver some care to poor and needy people that stood in need of dental care that couldn't get it. It was this amazing, amazing experience of a tide of people being helped by this incredible program. I got there before five in the morning and there was already a line formed of people waiting to get these services. We worked with a man that it was four days that he stood out waiting for this, so he was the first in line. It was amazing to see their smile. Their smile was genuine, and it was probably for the first time in many years that they were able to show their teeth. You meet some people that are really different than what I would meet in private practice, and they perhaps appreciated what we did more than the regular patients in the private practice. <laughs> See? <laughs> that is you. I forgot who you were. You don't realize the effect that having teeth has on a person. How do you like them? I like them. People look at me different now because I have teeth. So I know that I'm going to do something great. And I'm very thankful to Dr. Scott. I will never forget her. It's about as close as I feel I can get to doing what the Savior did, which is bless our fellow men with something that they lack. The feeling that you get when you serve is indescribable. High fly ball to deep left center field. McCutcheon on the run. He's still going back. And it's gone! The San Diego Padres, they decided to form a community service team. They saw that as an opportunity to create goodwill in the community. So when we went in to teach them about Just Serve, they immediately saw that it was an opportunity that was great because it had resources, it had partnerships, it had service projects that they may not have known about. And when they heard about it, it was so easy to make that pitch and to make them understand. It probably took me 10 minutes to explain the concept before they just said, okay, let's do it. Because they were sold. They realized what a gift it was to the community. What's really exciting is that the people that sign up are able to work side by side with a major league player, a member of the San Diego Padres. And the Padres have made it their quest to teach morals and values such as hard work. Um, industry, volunteering, giving back to the community, so they mentor the kids that they volunteer with mainly. Just Serve is a partner with the San Diego Padres. They're able to access all the information and use Just Serve as a source of community service.
Following the Vietnam War, there were a lot of veterans out in the community that were homeless. There was a huge need to address the homeless situation in San Diego. And from that, Robert Van Curen and Dr. John Natchison found Stand Down. Stand Down is a military term from Vietnam where you back off the field of battle and other people take the watch. And so you can get your shower, you can get your new uniform on, you can sleep, knowing that your perimeter is safe. And for our veterans, we're the watch. How are you doing today, sir? Very good. I've been Marine Corps for three years in Vietnam, from 67 to 69. I was a sniper. Pretty hairy duty, but I was drafted, so I went. Any immediate need for safety, for food, for clothing, showers, those kinds of things, those are all basics. Beyond that, we also have uh, housing services, medical services, dental, optometry, every imaginable service that's available in San Diego, and we have many, uh, is here to meet the veteran where they are. Oh, wow. Thank you. I was surprised. It feels good. What are you going to go do now? Go see my life. <laughs> Thanks, brother. <laughs> Hey. Thank you. This wouldn't be possible. We couldn't do it without the volunteers. We couldn't do it without the community. It, it, it takes every person, every individual giving their time to make this happen. Our volunteers, those who come through the Just Serve website, are essential and critical to what we do here. This is what we need from our community. It doesn't happen without them. The night that Refugee Services of Texas called us that night, I knew that the process was going to be hectic and fast. When we found out that we were going to help host a refugee family of four, Refugee Services of Texas gave us a list of everything that we would need to help furnish their apartment. And we posted that on Facebook and people from all over the country started to pitch in. People bought what they thought they could afford. And so this really was a group effort. And that was really humbling. Every time we saw somebody purchase something, it was just, it was so humbling to see how many people um, wanted to participate and help. We had to go get some training from Refugee Services of Texas. And so my wife and I went through a training session so we would know uh, how to act, what they would expect, how we could make their transition as easy as possible. It was the day before they were going to arrive and we finally got the key to the apartment. We had people from our ward with their trucks and we unloaded it. And it wasn't just enough to unload everything, we had to assemble everything. The apartment wasn't that big, but everybody had their little space where they were building a piece of furniture and I was collecting all of the garbage to try and keep everything clear so that you could work. And the furniture just kept coming and, and rooms came together and um, it was fun. It was really fun, I thought. And then uh, the day came where we went down to the airport and picked up this family. He's just in here. Come on, let's go, guys. We're going to say a prayer, prayer before we go. Okay. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we're very grateful for this day. We're grateful for the opportunity to be helping a refugee family. And... My parents, they didn't really teach me about service. It's more like I learned from watching them after they do something like that. They're always just like really happy and you can just tell it by their expressions how it made them feel. So we're gonna go pick this family up at the airport and they are Syrian, but I don't think they've been in Syria for maybe a year. They've spent a lot of time in a refugee camp in Jordan. I would kind of played it out in my head I was gonna go, but as we were getting closer to the airport, 
I was kind of realizing, you know, this is like nothing like I thought it was going to be. You guys ready? They've landed. 62.96? Yeah. I told my siblings, like, you know, make sure to smile extra big. And I remember the translator just saw their heads kind of coming above the frosted glass near the, the exit, and he just said, there they are. And the doors open, and these two little kids, and mom and dad came out, and we just greeted him. Marhaban fi America? OK. Greg. Greg. Mohammed. I think we had this idealized image of what a greeting at the airport would be like. That they would come out and we would hug and welcome them to their new life and their new country. But the fact is, they were tired, they were hungry, they were two parents with two little boys that they wanted to make sure were nearby them and didn't wander off. The dad especially I knew was stressed out. He looked so tired. But it took a long time for him to relax enough to smile. I think it was at least 10 minutes before he could smile. So to just be there for them and have cars that could take their luggage, to know that their apartment was going to be furnished, to just give them a softer we're, we're cushion for landing, I think made a big difference for them. It made a big difference for us. The woman, when we greeted her, just for her to say over and over again, it's just so nice to see somebody smiling at us, was, I mean, that's, I'm not gonna change this family's life forever, but at that moment, if it was helpful, that's profound. Okay, good. All right. Yeah. Okay. Let them go. Oh, this Muhammad. It's for you. I can't imagine what they've gone through. You know, to be refugees, to have to leave your country and leave your home because of uh, religious or political beliefs, and to know that you have two young sons that you're trying to give a better life to, how can you not want to help people who are trying to make a better life for their children? My father was an immigrant, and I, for that reason, this felt very close to me. I feel like I am a product of someone else's kindness. I don't know if these people will remember who I am. I don't know what our involvement in their life will be. But I like that they may always remember that there was an American family who was there to help them. And even more, I love the fact that my children saw what it was like to reach a hand out and help strangers. I want my own children to gain the wisdom that comes from that kind of service. I've been told stories about my ancestors since I was a kid, and I realized that the things that they're remembered for are their acts of service. And one of the stories that I remember most is one my grandma used to tell about her uncle, Alma Richards. And Alma Richards was a high jumper and a sprinter who was the first gold medalist in the Olympics from Utah. He said he used to chase the jackrabbits in the field, and that's how he got to be so quick. After his sports career, Uncle Alma went on to get a law degree and pass the bar exam in California. But rather than go into law, he decided to become a high school teacher and coach. And I think that's because he really just wanted to have an influence in the lives of younger people and be a guide for them and help them have some of the same joys that he had had in life. I think there's a great need in the world today for people to be able to shift from what they want and find a way where they can shift some of that 
to others of our Heavenly Father's children who are desperately in need. I think it's the answer to happiness. I think it's the answer to humanity. Especially being a teenager, it's just, it's really the time where you're figuring yourself out and there's so much insecurity. The way to fix that, it's by getting out and helping someone else because it helps you not be selfish and not think about your own problems. It's almost like a distraction, but it's one that will heal you. I think that everybody has to decide what kind of human being they're going to be and if they're going to be an authentic person or a non-authentic person. And when I saw Just Serve come about, I thought that this was a vehicle that could spread that spirit of service among people and that everybody could feel that same way. It takes on a life of its own. I feel a closeness to the Lord. I feel a, a confidence in Him, that He has confidence in me. That's pure religion right there. Whenever we get on our knees and ask our Heavenly Father, who needs my help? He'll provide a way, and it will be the right time in the right place, and He'll magnify our efforts no matter how small. Elder Maxwell, amongst many things that he taught, he said that we cannot do what the Savior did, but we can do as the Savior did. There's a power behind it. And my testimony with being associated with Just Serve is the de-inspiration of our Heavenly Father and even the divine guidance of the Lord Jesus Christ we have felt as this has been prepared and now is moving out to serve and bless the world. One of Uncle Alma's favorite poems was called Prayer of the Sportsman. And I think I have an idea of why it was one of his favorite pieces. Dear Lord, in the battle that goes on through life, I ask but a field that is fair, a chance that is equal with all in the strife, a courage to strive and to dare. And if I should win, let it be by the code, with my faith and my honor held high. And if I should lose, let me stand by the road and cheer as the winners go by. Let me say, there they ride, on whom laurels bestowed, since they played the game better than I. Let me stand with a smile by the side of the road and cheer as the winners go by. Yea, teach me to stand by the side of the road and cheer as the winners go by.